We should never allow the government to decide what is acceptable speech and what is unacceptable speech. Um, we, should, we should penalize behaviors, not opinions, and not speech. Uh, if you start trying to regulate speech, you start trying to regulate uh, thoughts, you start trying to regulate beliefs rather than behaviors, uh, there's no way that you're not going to abridge the constitutional rights of millions of Americans. That, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. That, you didn't build that. Somebody else That, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. Started in America. Do you even care? You should. Your life is about to change forever from it. Today's video is going to be about a subject that, uh, I had some personal um, involvement with myself. Back in the 1980s, it was very popular for employers to use polygraphs. And in Florida, at the time I was living down there, um, they used polygraphs for pre-employment. So you had to take the polygraph exam to validate the fact that you um, were honest and you were truthful about uh, about what you were saying to your employer and uh, if you didn't pass it of course then they wouldn't hire you. My personal call about polygraphs are first of all that they're unconstitutional because um, some people psychologically don't pass them because they're always nervous and it's just an inherent trait in some people to be that way. So it's not always a true fact that somebody who's nervous or, uh, you know, just tense uh, are not telling you the truth, that they aren't uh, being honest in their answers because the machine will only detect certain uh, variations in, in, your, in your vital signs, in your uh, different... Uh, sensations, you know, heartbeat, respiration, all the rest of it. So some people, it's been proven in times past that you can say something and based on the interpretation of the, uh, the polygraph examiner, he can either interpret it to be it's a lie or it's the truth. So it's, it's, it's mostly based on the the human condition, the person doing the actual examination. And if it's wrong, then you're not only condemning the applicant, but you're also showing that the validity of using polygraphs is not 100% accurate. Because all this information that it's obtaining about you may or may not be truthful to begin with. I mean, it's just basing it on certain criteria 
that they've set up of, as far as what a polygraph is supposed to do and how you're supposed to interpret what it is that it's saying through these different readings. Uh, when I say that I have experience with polygraphs, um, I got a job in in uh, in Brandon, which is outside of Tampa. Back in the 80s, I worked for a jewel. It was a jewelry store. It was called Wilcor, and they sold primarily the same stuff that service merchandise did. They sold electronics, sold sporting goods, sold jewelry and clothing. Pretty much everything you found in, in service merchandise, they had it. They did not sell. Um, movies. I don't think they sold VHS tapes at that time, but um, it was based out of Lakeland, which is in Polk County. And during the year that I worked for, for Wilcore Jewelers, their entire process of employment was entirely based and centered around a polygraph examination. What do I mean by that? Uh, there was one instance where uh, there were more than 50 people working at the store at the time I was there, and something came up missing in our store. The first thing the managers did was to accuse everybody of having stolen something. So first they threatened everybody. They said, if nobody comes forward and admits they stole the item, we're going to have every employee to take a polygraph test. If you refuse to take the polygraph test, it proves that you're guilty and they would fire you flat out. And uh, this is their rationale for every event that's ever, that had ever happened at their store. Every time something came up missing, this is the first thing they'd say. You either admit you stole it, you admit that um, you know where it is, or they would have every person in the store to take a polygraph to find out whether somebody was lying or not. The, uh, the manager's name was Mrs. Cass. Uh, she, uh, I never forget her, she was like in her late 50s, early 60s, but she was by the book as far as Wilcor's policies of what they were to follow. And the first thing was always to um, use intimidation by saying we will have you uh, take the polygraph exam or you're fired. And uh, anyway, what ended up happening in that one instance is that the item they thought somebody stole, it was just put in the wrong place. Not only did they not apologize for making the accusation, but um, in the whole time I worked for the company, they never tried to validate the reasoning behind using only a polygraph as a determination of whether or not you could, could stay there and stay employed at their company. So by the time I left the, the, the store, as far as Wilcor, when I resigned, I was so ecstatic because I knew that they were going to use this excuse about uh, using the polygraph every opportunity they could to try and either worm out certain people they didn't like or to uh, intimidate people enough that some people would resign, which it worked in some instances. Some people did quit because of what they were putting them through. Um, but when I took the polygraph the first time, I felt it was uh, it was a hindrance on how you feel about yourself because you think if I'm saying something and the machine reads wrong as to what I really was trying to say to them. Uh, it just it just blacklisted you, you know. You could never apply there again. And I have to say, no other store or any other company I've worked for has never used a polygraph uh, as a determination for uh, hiring people, based on using that option to prove whether or not you were being truthful or you were being honest in uh, what you were saying uh, to the examiner or what you might have been indirectly trying to say to your to your potential employer was that uh, to the best of my knowledge uh, this these facts are true these statements are true because I know that that's what I remember or what happened um, and if the examiner was wrong and how he interpreted 
what he was reading. Uh, it meant that uh, the chance she might have had to go back and reapply again was over because they kept records of all that. All that information was kept about who you were and about uh, the fact that you did ex that you went in there and you did go to apply for that for that job. Wilcor, as far as I know, went out of business. They probably had problems in the years after that because of how they treated people by intimidation of using that that um, threat of an examination to determine whether or not they felt you were qualified to stay there because they didn't feel they could trust you anymore. Um, when uh, I worked for Wheelcor, this is the first time I can remember that any company had ever stayed open on the holidays, especially for Thanksgiving. Um, I'm not sure about Christmas. Maybe they did close for Christmas, but I do know I remember we were open normal hours on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, this was in 1986, and at that time it was totally unheard of in at least the southeastern United States for a company to be open on a holiday like Thanksgiving. So while everybody else was at home enjoying their turkey dinner, we were out there at Wheelcore busting our butts trying to uh, uh, satisfy Mrs. Cass and the other management team that was out there because when you worked, you were intimidated half the time because they felt like your sales aren't there. We did not make commission based on uh, how much you sold in the store. Uh, it was hourly, which I liked that because I felt like, why should I have to take a loss in my wages because I didn't make a, a certain number of quoted or quota items that I sold that day. Um, but uh, in my experience of polygraphs, I said from the beginning that it was unconstitutional because you cannot interpret somebody else's uh, reactions to the machine based on just it being the person doing the examination. Uh, and plus the fact that uh, because of uh, a person's reactions, the machine might read it wrong or it might read it incorrectly and then uh, the, the the operator who's doing the exam may automatically think, okay, he lied in this question, he he lied in that question, he didn't, he wasn't honest, he wasn't truthful about what he was saying in that in that situation. So uh, it's just ironic how over the years people still are are paranoid as far as one subject or the other, like they don't think people who aren't truthful enough uh, deserve that chance to to work somewhere. And I'm just I'm really glad that people do not use that as as entirely a basis of whether you're qualified for a job based on the machine telling them uh, they lied or they're not being honest and whatever other reason. Before I end my video, I, I've either showed it to you or I'm going to show you to you the fact that um, YouTube is now uh, penalizing people with no cause at all as far as doing copyright strikes on your accounts. They can make uh, the false assumption that either... Uh, your copyright strike is based on someone else saying that the video violated uh, either their code of ethic or that it contained video from somebody else's video even though it was in a small size box. And what YouTube does now is if you try to do a counter notification against somebody who did a copyright strike against you, they use really no excuse at all to say it's not justified for us to reevaluate why the video was taken down or removed. And the video statement about counter notification is, is shown and will be shown in this video to show everybody that their reason for not looking into the case was simply they didn't want to. 
that's that's stated in the in the very first part of their reasoning. They said it is our interpretation there is no validity to your claim that we should reevaluate why your why your video was removed and that you as a YouTube videographer have no legal rights any longer to pursue YouTube about them re-examining and reinstating your video. This is what it said at the bottom of that of that statement. It said it is entirely your choice as an American citizen to prosecute and pursue litigation through a lawsuit against either YouTube or through the video uh, person who actually removed your your particular video from your channel. In other words, it's up to you to prosecute us or prosecute the person who did who, who hit you with a copyright strike and that YouTube takes no responsibility for having removed that video without even them examining or an, doing an analysis or an overview of your reasons for why it happened. And that's why I say it's socialism because that's what socialism is about. Uh, they don't have to justify their actions because it's about them controlling you as a citizen, as a person, and deciding whether or not what you post is something that they feel uh, is acceptable to society. In other words, they're deciding for you of whether or not a video you make is something that they think should be shown publicly to other people. And that's a total violation of your freedom of speech. It's not only a freedom of speech issue, it's also a freedom of, of expression. That is not to say that some people, and I'm referring directly to Christian Gronau, he can do parodies of anybody he wants. The only reason YouTube has not taken his videos down on any of those cases is because he is monetized. He makes money for YouTube. Because of that reason, YouTube looks the other way whenever somebody brings up some claim against him uh, that he doesn't appreciate or he doesn't like that fact that you have said those things about him. And then YouTube retaliates against people. And if that is not a clear case of socialistic uh, mandated uh, changes in our freedoms as an American society, then I don't know what is. Uh, besides the fact that it's, it's, it's bribery on the case of, of YouTube. A year or two ago, there was this Muslim woman who was monetized, and all of a sudden, one day, YouTube took all her rights away. They, demon they demonopolized her account. I don't know. She didn't, they didn't pull her whole channel down. But they told her, you're not entitled to make money anymore, and we're not going to pay you any money. She went into their offices, and she shot three employees because of how they retaliated against her, because of what they said were the reasons for the fact that she was no longer monetized. Now, today, 2019, Glenn Beck does a video... And he says, I'm, I'm making this video free for one reason, because he says they're already demonopolizing de uh, de my, uh, my channels. He said, I had three channels at one time that were making me money, so I could continue to do videos and support this. He said, they've taken all of that revenue away from me. He says, they've totally taken away that monetization. And he said, um, he based it entirely on how quickly... Communism and socialism has taken over within not only our government, but it has filtered into all of the social platforms where people have, have had the legal rights to speak out on certain things. And now the communists and the socialists are saying you can't say that anymore because that's in total contradiction to the philosophies and the policies that the, 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 the socialist democrats are imposing on American society. And that's definitely why YouTube is doing this right now. That is why YouTube is retaliating against people who speak out and say these things. Christian Grunau, 
I'm not saying that he has as yet taken all my videos down based entirely on the fact the videos have been about him. So far, YouTube has only removed the video that actually had some video footage from his channel. And I think what we're seeing here, what these retaliatory things are happening, it's an artificial intelligence that YouTube is using. And it's, it's looking for all these things. Every so often, I get this, I get this, uh, this statement from YouTube. They put an age restriction on some of my videos, and they say, uh, uh, we have had uh, complaints from other YouTubers about certain things you're posting in this video or that video. And they say, it's not being removed, but we're putting age restrictions. What that is, is the artificial intelligence is looking at all our videos. It is interpreting what is and what is not acceptable speech under socialism and in the case of artificial intelligence because it's not really human it can be programmed to interpret certain things and it can pick it up just like that and then it starts to say they can't say that it can't uh it, it isn't going to just literally at this point take down the video eventually they probably will because once socialism totally can't, controls everything, uh, then you're going to have this, this, uh, this artificial intelligence system saying to people, you're now in violation of the now global mandate of, of uh, conformity to what uh, the global government tells you to believe, what to think, what to say uh, in your video. And it is not acceptable to us anymore, so therefore your video is being removed. And Christian Gronau and his bribery situation with money that he gives to YouTube, and then they turn around and they give him special advantage or favoritism, that is um, an indication that artificial intelligence is starting to do this philosophy of socialism to everybody, but they're hiding behind the facade of saying, uh, we have to help support people who are helping support us by giving money by us making money from the videos that you post and that's what socialism is eventually going to do in this country it's going to hide as much as it can behind something else it's doing and then once Obama once the communists take total control and they wipe everything and everybody else out then uh, all the social platforms are going to be totally policed by artificial intelligence and anything you do and anything you say if it's in contradiction to communism, to socialism, it's gone, and they will take it down, and that's it. You won't have a right to appeal. You won't have a right to speak out and say this is unconstitutional. It isn't. Uh, it's entire. It's an inviolation of the Bill of Rights. These are all basic human civil liberties that we're supposed to be entitled to in America, and the more socialism takes over, the more they're saying. There is no such thing as the Bill of Rights. There is no such thing as the United States Constitution. And here's proof. We're doing all this stuff, and you can't do one thing about it. You cannot speak out against this. You cannot do anything, because that's what the government wants. And that's what a lot of these people who are potheads are doing, too. They don't care what happens. As long as they have their heroin and their marijuana and that free cell phone, they don't care what the government does to you. Because that's the only thing that matters to them. And then, of course, having the chance to watch all the videos that they see on YouTube for free. And it doesn't cost them nothing. Similarity to all of that is the fact that Obama gave amnesty to the Mexicans and said, You come here, we won't make you leave. He gave them free welfare. He gives them a free check. He gives them a free driver's license so they can vote, which by law is illegal. And you think... Are there any similarities here between what YouTube is doing to its actual subscribers or its, its videographers, its American citizens? Yes, there's an obvious correlation between what they're doing on the social part of our whole government system and then what they're doing as far as your individual rights of free speech. They're saying, we're going to say whether or not you can talk about something anymore on, on our channel. And there are very few platforms, if any, other than YouTube where you can post a video. You can on Facebook, 
But really, it doesn't last on Facebook more than one day. You post a video, it's gone after that. They eradicate it off their channel because they're trying to refresh it all the time. YouTube is the only place where you can post videos and know it'll still be there unless YouTube itself takes it down because they don't think that what you're saying is something they feel is an acceptable uh, uh, subject to talk about. So that's one reason I want to show this statement about what YouTube is doing to us because it's a, it's a wake-up call every day to us about how this country is now manipulating and controlling us on a actual mental basis. And Edward Snowden said this when he actually first went, came forward and told the, he told the world, he said, this is what they're doing to us. And then the government itself retaliated and they went after him because he said that. He didn't, he didn't disclose any information. All he said was, they're doing this to us. And instead of him trying to take his chances with the judicial system, which is also actually under socialist control now, he fled the United States. He went to Russia because he knew at least there he'd have a fighting chance to survive doing something. Here, he'd be in jail now. If not, they would have probably have executed him for having told the American public what really we're entitled to know. He told us what the National Security Administration does with your phone calls, what they are doing with every kind of a telecommunication device in your house, like um, the, uh, the Alexa system, all these other things. They eavesdrop. They listen to everything we're saying. And then they say, oh, well, no, we're just doing it for analysis purposes. It's like, no, that's a lie because you know what they're doing with all that information. They're storing it. They're making, they're making dossiers on every American citizen in this country. Then they're going to go back, have the computer to do an analysis and, and, and do a total file of everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done. And then they're going to say, look, this is what you said this date. This is what you said that date. And then they're going to put you not in jail. I say this flat out. They're going to put you in a FEMA camp because when Obama was president, he said those FEMA camps exist already. They're already there. And now you see why those FEMA camps exist. It isn't for crowd control. It's going to be for those that they consider to be subversives, those who are against a global socialist global government, a communist government. And once they do that, once they instigate it, it's going to be just like the biggest mass trial in history. They're going to be bringing people to court. And they're going to say, now we're going to look at you and we're going to figure out whether or not you justify yourselves to be a danger to society. And we're going to use all this evidence as proof of who you are, what you think, what you are saying to everybody else around you. And then we're going to say whether you're dangerous. You're dangerous, you're already in the FEMA camp. And eventually, if you're in a FEMA camp, it's going to be like what happened during the Holocaust. The Holocaust was the Jews were brought to the camp and they separated them. And it was entirely based on probably quotas. How many people came in that day? And then they did more than half of the people who came in. They sent them to the gas chamber. Or the other hard part of it was they put them in either uh, forced manual labor. And those were always men. And the women themselves were either used for medical experiments or they were, um, in some cases, they were put in crematoriums. They burned them to death. I know what that's like. My sister died in a firebombing. And uh, you think, oh, we're beyond that. We'll never do such things again. Mm -mm. you got a communist dictator like Barack Obama, and he has the same philosophies Adolf Hitler had. And if Adolf Hitler could kill two or three hundred million uh, civilian lives in the, in the Jewish Holocaust, do you think anything compared to that uh, genocide compares to now where they have computers and they've got all this technology helping them to instigate these things and people don't even see that they don't even want to think those things but it's happening and it's gonna keep happening because nobody cares to take a side to an issue they don't want to uh, they don't want to ruffle the water by trying to take a stand because they know it's wrong 
in the case of three states, three states are saying, literally, abortion is murder. They won't say murder on television. They won't say it in the political arenas where the Democrats are the ones advocating for women's rights. They don't say, we don't care if this is the murder of an unborn child. They don't even do that differential. They don't designate or say whether or not it's death by uh, an actual act um, of somebody who says, we're not killing anything. We're taking something out that's a foreign matter inside a woman's body. In other words, they're, they're devaluing human life by saying we are not going to say the word murder. We are not going to say this is uh, a genocide of the unborn. Uh, we're just not going to recognize any word that relates to murder in this situation, that it's only the woman's choice and that's it. There is no other definition that politicians are now using to define human life, whether it's murder, that you're killing somebody, or not. They say there's a heartbeat. You've got women who say that's not even a valid reason not to allow a, an abortion. In other words, we don't recognize it as human until we say it's human. And this is a woman talking. This is a woman saying to our political system, this is about me having the rights to kill whatever and whoever I want because it's my body. And that does not in any way reflect what this is about. You are the carrier. You are not the creator of human life. Women believe that. They believe that when they conceive a child, it is them doing it. And it's not. God gives you that child. You don't give yourself that child. I don't care what you believe. And when you take that right that God has now given to you to have that child and you say, I don't want this, and I don't care if it was incest or rape, you have other options. You could have that child put up for adoption. You could choose to feel like this is a part of me. It is not in any way just the guy that did that to you, they don't look at it like that. Because in their minds, they're trying to justify murder. They're trying to say, we can kill whoever we want to because it's our choice. And that's the end of the discussion, as far as they're concerned. That's what potheads do. They escape reality. They, they smoke marijuana every day because they're like, I don't want to hear that. I'm going to smoke marijuana or I'm going to, I'm going to smoke heroin. I'm going to take uh, fentanyl or any of this other stuff that they now are legalizing and say... Uh, if I don't have to hear that, then I feel good about myself because I have no guilty conscience. So I would like to see when this case comes before the United States Supreme Court that those judges finally define the interpretation of what is murder and what is not murder. If you kill an unborn baby and it had a heartbeat, that's murder because you already have identified the fact that something was in there and it was alive. And... If they don't take that issue up, if they don't say it flat out, it's murder. There is no hope that they'll ever stop it because that's the reasons for why socialism is so important. You silence people who try to tell you the truth and then there is no, uh, there is no other side to an issue. There is nobody else challenging whatever it is you're trying to tell people is reality. You shut them up, you close them down, and then there is nobody else to say anything about it because they've now silenced that other voice. Unborn children have no voice because they're not outside the body yet. They can't speak up for themselves and say, I don't want to die. I want to live. And that's, that's, that is really a key point to what abortion's about. Them denying the fact that murder is wrong. And if they don't say the word murder, then they don't feel that it is. Because nobody is, is going to say that. They're not going to say that to a mother who is expecting a child. It is not murder. That is not even a, 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 an acceptable explanation for this. It's about just you killing this, 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 this child that you don't want. That's how they rationale why they think Alabama's wrong, Georgia's wrong, 
Minnesota's wrong. Why? Because they're defining what is and is not murder. And that is unborn children are being executed, terminated, killed. And uh, they had on Fox News last week a senator. I can't believe this woman saying that it isn't about whether or not after the child is born whether you murder it. It is now entirely still the issue of whether it's the mother's right or not to kill that child, whether it's in the womb or it's not in the womb. She said that, and she's a presidential candidate. Some kind of a name, Chikata or something like that. I can't remember. I looked at her, and the whole time she was sitting there smirking, smiling. <laughs> I was like, you know, I wish I, I wish I could say to people like Pelosi and Schumer and Warren and all the rest of these people, if your mother had had the choice of abortion and she knew what you would turn out to be, would you be here now? I don't think so. Because your mother would have said, to think someday you're going to kill all those innocent unborn children because you don't believe that it's human. If your mother knew that, I guarantee you this country wouldn't be like this today because those mothers would be saying, I am not having this kid knowing it's going to kill all those innocent children, all those innocent uh, lives that didn't have a voice to speak out for themselves. Y'all really evaluate that before you vote next year in 2020 of who you're going to put in the White House. Donald Trump's the only hope this country has. Obama proved for eight years that communism and socialism do does not work. And all he did was advocate for the abnormal, the homosexual, the transgender, the bisexual, all these things. It's like, is, is our country better today because of it? Absolutely not. It's worse than it's ever been. And communism, folks, is a dead end to this country. If you allow communism and socialism to take over, you can forget any hope that we'd ever be the nation we used to be. So thank you very much for this chance to talk about not only polygraphs, but about what is this country. And it's going down the tube.
His name is Omran Daknesh, just five years old, and his feet barely hung over the edge of a seat in an ambulance. Dazed, he didn't cry as he wiped away blood and the I'm dust so of a building that collapsed around him in an airstrike. His silence somehow reminded the world today of its silence in the face of the atrocities in Aleppo. Omran was pulled out alive Wednesday. Five other children died when the building they were in was hit during the relentless Syrian-Russian offensive on rebel-held areas in Aleppo. The image of Omran's face spread like wildfire on the Internet. One tweet called him the real representative of the Syrian people. Stop killing uh, Syrian innocent people, civilian. Our uh, children uh, need to live in uh, peace. The doctor who treated Omran said today there were many more severe cases no one is paying attention to. We uh, need to protect uh, our hospital, our doctors, our uh, medical workers from uh, airstrike. Omran is recovering. His family now wants to escape. The same choice another boy's family made a year ago, Ilan Kurdi, whose body washed up on a beach. He too was a symbol of Syria's youngest victims. Now there's a new one. Tomorrow there may be another. Richard Engel, NBC News. They've reported from around the world, challenged the powerful, and they bring all of this to every story that breaks. We've got breaking news and it's good news. And it touches your heart. How do you even say thank you? Thank you is not big enough. Thank you.